TCL is a proud sponsor of the Score North Studios. Enjoy more of the things you love with TCL. If you're a golf lover, join in on fun discussions about golf. From the perspective of two plugged-in Minnesota golf geeks, Brad Cole and David Branstad. This is 10,000 Swings. Hello and welcome back to 10,000 Swings. It is Sunday, April 11th. 2021. I'm Brad Cole. I'm David Branstead. Oh, do I get to jump in now? I'm Phil yeah, Mackey. Y- you do. Phil Mackey's here with us tonight. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about this week, friends. Uh, the Masters. It was it was something. Uh, we have a huge University of Minnesota golf update. We also have a little beautiful oh, Masters music. Hello, friends. Phil, Phil you're going to make me cry. <laughs> But again, for those that don't know, we do have Phil Mackey with us tonight. Phil Mackey from Score North, Hubbard Broadcasting, now in Seattle. Yeah, I got invited. What, what's the um, what's that PJ Championship course up here? I can't remember the name of it. Where it's the Holly or no, uh, no, Chambers no, Bay? Chambers Bay. Chambers Bay is. I think Chambers Bay is the one where Dustin Johnson uh, three putted from like twelve feet or something. <laughs> Yes, to, to whiff on the mayor. So I got I got invited to play that course two weeks ago. We my wife and I moved out here a month ago, and as David knows, because I've been sending him little videos, like I'm like <laughs> I'm like as mentally and physically like between swings as I've ever been in my life. And so I turned down an invitation to play at Chambers Bay because no. I was so like ashamed of my golf game. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to oh. go out there and shoot like one thirty and look like an idiot in front of you know qualified golfers. And so yeah. Could you have just walked along, <laughs> guys? I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just be your personal beverage cart guy. Well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just sit there and I'll do some caddying for you. Maybe, maybe that's my role at these nice golf clubs. I guess. <laughs> what, what would the response be from your group if you show up on the first tee, pay the green fee with no clubs, and just say, you know, I'm between swings right now. <laughs> I'm not not fully committed, so instead of shaming myself and you know wasting your time, I'm just I'm just here to hang out. I'm just here to uh, to get the Pacific Northwest breeze. Yeah, it'll be it'll be great. <laughs> and, and Phil, no offense, they're gonna be disappointed with you as the beverage cart person. I know, I know, that's I know. I have been working out though, so okay, good. Let's see, so I didn't mean to hijack the first three minutes of this show. I'll no, shut that's... up so you can so you can tee up the. Uh, <laughs> The, the the masters talk here that is by far better than anything we could have come up with so that's uh that's good stuff <laughs> phil excited to have you back on the show what a what an interesting weekend probably one of the most non-interesting ma- uh masters i've seen and then every once in a while it got interesting for like 20 to 30 minutes and then it went back to kind of boring again uh there were so many things happening all the time, and then there were plenty of times where there was nothing happening. It was it was kind of weird. How about like on Thursday, Justin Rose went nine under in his final ten holes. It, this looks like a runaway for him. Then he he just shuts down. Hideki finishes round three, shooting twenty nine in the back nine, and then Xander on Sunday starting hole twelve goes birdie, 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 birdie. Triple. Like we thought it was gonna get interesting, and it just it, it did, like you said, Brad. It got interesting for about five minutes, and that was about it. I mean, I would I mean, first and foremost, Hideki is a wonderful player, and I'm I'm happy that he won his first major, and I think now he's gonna be etched into super stardom in uh his home country of Japan. And so like I am not like any any analysis from me about like Sunday and the weekend has nothing to do with a slight on him, but I think we all just want to see drama. And we all like when when Hideki popped that ball into the water, and all of a sudden, what I think at one point was a seven stroke lead for sure, six. He had a six stroke lead for a few holes. All of us, it wasn't that we were rooting against him, it was we're rooting for something interesting to watch, right? And um, and it felt like we got it there for about ten seconds, and then Xander went bonkers on sixteen, and his his post. So he did, and he's great, by the way. I feel like he's gonna he's gonna win multiple majors at some point, and 
It kind of feels like he's been around longer than he has. He's only like 27 years old, and he just keeps finishing top five, top ten in majors. And Amanda Balionis did the interview with him after the round was over, and she just sort of asked, like, hey, what happened on 16 there? And was it, it you know, Dottie out on the course said she didn't think you were, you know, having a mental hiccup. She thought that, you know, it was just sort of bad luck. And he said, yeah, honestly, I flushed that ball. I hit it perfectly exactly where I wanted it to go. And I'm being aggressive in that spot because I'm trying to hunt down the leader. And it was just like a bad circumstance. Should he have been that aggressive in that spot? Would no. you, or, or would you guys have advised him if he said, all right, you guys, 10,000 swings, guys. You're my new advisors here on the back nine at the Masters. Would you have told him, just put the ball on the green, take your par, and then see what happens on 17-18? I actually said this. Okay. Hit it to 50 feet. You just hit it out to the right. You could hit one club less, two clubs less. That green's very long. Just hit it short right. Everything's going to bound forward and left. You leg it up there, tap it in, move on. Hideki was reeling at that point. Like Xander was owning the tournament, and it just got way too aggressive. I mean, it's very easy to have a two- or three-stroke swing on hole 18 alone or on 17. He didn't need to press it on, on 16. And, and unfortunately, if he had just parred the last three, he ties Hideki, right? And who knows? He might have even beat Hideki if he not had made the, the triple that obviously kind of made things a little bit easier for Hideki. So it was hard to watch, to be honest. And he's now has, you know, I don't know how many top tens in the majors, but it's, he's been in the top ten in every major. And just it's hard to see. It's My question is, is does this send him on a Rory McIlroy trajectory? where he wins <laughs> some majors, you know, or is he going to be a Ricky Fowler type where he just gets a lot of top tens in majors but doesn't get the job done? Because Xander doesn't show any weakness except for these random holes. I mean, he made a triple and a double today and was still right there. So so looking at his major history, this is not including today. You look at the last two years, the last seven majors. He has his worst finish is a tie for 41st at the Open Championship in 2019. He's been in the top 20 at every single major, including three top fives. That's amazing. Right. And that doesn't include today. This guy's legit, but I mean, are we the new Tony Fino that just can't win? Like, I like to finish second a lot. I don't know. I feel like, like, I. Sometimes when I watch Tony Finau, and by the way, he's never won a tournament, period, which I think is different <laughs> than what Xander's going to do. He technically has one tournament win. He the has P the a PGA the Porter, Tour event? He, yeah. The Puerto Rico Open, which I believe is the one that's the same time as the WGC event. Oh. So it's not right. the same <laughs> tier. Right. <laughs> it's an yeah, asterisk. So so you take you, you take the hundred best players in the world out, and then right yeah, or whatever whatever the field is, um, sixty four. Yeah, Shoffley feels to me like sometimes guys just need to take lumps into their into their mid to late twenties, and he it feels like he's taken more lumps in a short period of time because he's always in the mix. I legitimately think, even though he's not a huge household mainstream name yet, I legitimately think he's going to have a handful of majors when it's all said and done. He just, he just seems like the type of dude that, like, I know that he triple bogeyed in a horrible spot today, and so it's going against my argument, but he seems like the type of dude that sort of rises up in moments of golf crisis, and he just hasn't had that final breakthrough yet. Um, Tony Finau seems like he gets really nervous in big moments to me, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just my perception, but it feels like Xander loves the big moment. And just hasn't had the payoff yet. He was also going toe to toe with Tiger two years ago um, on the back nine of the Masters too. So like he's he's in these things and he's fun to watch. So Ken Venturi gives Will Zalatoris a lesson as a kid and tells the parents, "Hey, this kid's going to be great. Your job is to stay out of the way." And I thought that was pretty awesome and very impressive that the parents were able to do that. And I wonder if, like, what that would have done for the ball boys if LeVar Ball would have just like stayed out of the way and just let them do you know, what they were kind of destined to do. Or some of the different athletes over the years that have had issues with their parents getting in the way, how much different that would be if they just kind of let their kid play the sport. What do you think, Phil? 
Um, well, I mean, I, I used to, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of LeVar Ball, but he did pump out two NBA players and one that looks like he's going to be a superstar, even with his crazy parenting style. It would be interesting to see, like, okay, LaMelo Ball and Lonzo Ball with more of a hands-off, supportive, normal parent. <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't have gone as far. I'm, I want to know more about this Ken Venturi run-in when he was, like, six years old at the golf range and... Ken Venturi comes walking up and shows him how to properly grip a golf club. Like, can we, can we all just be that lucky where you're six years old and you're just <laughs> hack, you're just hacking around with like a plastic club, and then like, whatever the modern day equivalent to Ken Venturi just comes walking up to you randomly and shows you how to properly hold a golf club and launches you into a career making millions of dollars. Right? Couldn't we all be so lucky? I was I was told once by an athletic director when I coached high school golf, your job is to not screw these players up. <laughs> <laughs> Just be encouraging you, and right. uh, yeah, it, yeah. But I mean, Ken Venturi, Ken Ken freaking Venturi, really? Uh, <sighs> well, they showed pictures today of Will Zalatoris, like age four and five. And I think somebody, one of the announcers said, like, that's a power move. Like, he was ripping it at a very young age. And he, you know, he's become close buddies with Tony Romo. Like, he's got some pretty cool people in his corner. Like, Jim Nance on on Thursday, I think, or maybe it was Friday. It was either Thursday or Friday. It was, it was before the weekend. And Jim Nance brought up that Tony Romo has been texting him when, when, when uh, Zalatoris started popping up on the leaderboard for the first time, and he said, Tony Romo's been texting me. They played together at a pro-am, and he predicted before the tournament started that Will Zalatoris was going to win the Masters this weekend. No yeah, I don't know if you guys caught that anecdote, but yeah, but Tony Romo was like lighting up Jim Nance, and Jim Nance brought it up on the broadcast and said he predicted that Will Zalatoris is going to win the Masters this weekend, that like no one knows how good this kid is, but Romo's seen it. How about that? Tony Romo calling plays at the line of scrimmage and calling the breakout of Will Zalatoris this weekend. Guess, Pretty impressive. I guess that's why he's getting paid what he is. <laughs> so I really, really need to talk about Bryson. I've been all week long. I mean, did this guy just mess with the golf gods when he came out and said, Augusta's a par 67, I can drive three, I can get on all the par fives and two, it's a par 67 because according to my calculations, he shot 25 over par this week. Mm. So, I mean, this guy is just, he just keeps poking the bear, right? Like, don't, don't, you don't say that about Augusta. Maybe after you've won four or five Masters, maybe at that point you can say it. But, wow, he is, uh, that, that was very interesting to watch. Did, did he say that this year too? Because I know he said it last, well, it would be, what's that, November. Yeah, he, I guess, I don't know that he reiterated it, but I think it's just kind of a given. Like, a lot of people were tweeting about it at the beginning of the week. Like, oh, let's see Bryson's par 67, right? And, you know, people don't forget. <laughs> you, know, you can't just say things like that. So it was it was highly entertaining. And again, remember last year, Dustin shot 20 under. So essentially, Bryson said, you know, that Dustin shot par. And, you know, it, it's amazing to me, too, in addition to Bryson, like, you know, Bryson made the cut, but the guys that missed the cut this week, I don't know if you kept track, Phil, of all of the notable names that missed the cut, but that was nuts. I mean, Fred Couples should always be in the mix on Saturday and Sunday, right? And, and no Fred Couples, uh, no Sung J M, which was pretty surprising for how well he's been playing. Jason Day, Patrick Cantlay, Rory McIlroy, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, Sergio, Matt Kuchar. Uh, Pretty, pretty surprising. You know, on the Bryson front, I think one of the things that bothers me about him, and I think other people are more bothered by him than I am, I think he's great for the sport because he's, he's just an interesting figure, and he's he does things differently. He's He generates discussion and buzz, and he's fun to watch, even if you are just, like, hate-watching him, right? Like, every sport needs the Yankees. Every sport needs the Miami Heat with the big three to root against, and I think he's sort of becoming that for golf. But, like, of the many things that people could pick out to hate about Bryson DeChambeau, the thing that actually drives me the most nuts is when he's out of contention, and it could be any tournament, but specifically at the Masters, the Masters, and it's Sunday, and you're out of contention, and you freaking, like, you you bomb a drive, and then you take a pitching wedge into a par five, and then you sink the putt for eagle, which I think he, I'm pretty sure he eagled a hole on, like, the front nine today. It might have been 13. I can't remember which hole it was. 
And the crowd, like, pops for you, and it's kind of a big moment, and all right, you're not going to win, but man, like, you just played the hell out of that hole, dude, and you just sunk an eagle putt. And rather than, like, enjoying the moment and tipping his cap and smiling and, like, you know, maybe give a shoulder shrug to the caddy, like, oh, well, it's been a tough week, but I'm going to enjoy this moment. He just pouts off the green, like, oh, I should have been doing that all week, right? He can't just, like, (laughs) like, Phil Mickelson doesn't contend in these majors anymore, and yet he'll make a nice shot or something, and... And he'll understand, like, yeah, I'm not contending, but all right, this is pretty fun. I'm Phil Bleep and Mickelson, and these people love me, and they're cheering for me. Like, Bryson has no ability to just stop and enjoy the moment. It feels like he's just always, like, in a battle against the media or in a battle against the weather or the course. Like, something's always screwing him over, it kind of feels like. And I just I don't love that quality about him. Personally. I, I think it was Brandel Chambly talking earlier in the week about how Bryson's not going to do well this week because the Masters and Augusta National doesn't give out the same yardage books and and green reading books. And Bryson's notorious for like triple checking these over four foot putts, six foot putts, eight foot putts. And all of a sudden he's forced to actually just feel his way around a golf course. Mm-hmm. That's not him. He's too mechanical. It's... It's mechanical to a fault, in my opinion. But those mechanics did get him a 374-yard drive on 18 to a flip wedge and a and a birdie to you know to put a cherry on his pile of not so great. So that you know he it does work for him at times, but I just feel like this place is just the one place he can't overpower, and uh, he's so used to overpowering everything. It's kind of fun to see. You know the the golf gods, if you will, just say no. That that, that doesn't work here. Like you got to finesse your way around Augusta National. Yeah, and it is kind of amazing too. I mean, you know, the winning score and the conditions are different in the fall. It was it was the first ever November Masters, but it, I was a little bit worried when DJ went to minus twenty last year. It was like, oh my god, or is this is the Masters just going to turn into a race to minus twenty now, like every other tournament on tour? And so I I liked that. It was kind of a grind to get to minus 10 at the end of this one. It kind of kind of brought it back to where the scores should be at the Masters. And once in a while, somebody will pop up to like minus 14, minus 15. But I was a little worried when DJ went minus 20. Like, all right, now Bryson's going to go minus 23 or something. And we just, we've just lost all control of, 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 of Augusta. And I think all of that is 100% based on water, right? Like it was so, so soft last fall. And this week it wasn't soft. I mean, Thursday, I've never seen Augustus Greens look like that on Thursday. That was it's almost like they had had a couple of guys come in from the USGA to kind of, you know, spice things up a little bit. But it, it showed some teeth. You really had to miss. Your misses were so important this week. And that's, you know, it, it's it's major golf. It was still 10 under. People still shot 66. So I didn't mind it. You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of the U.S. Open when it's really cool to shoot par. Like I want 66 to be a good round. And there were still plenty of 66s, 7s, and 8s this week. So it's not like it wasn't totally. But you had to keep on it because uh, I don't think anyone had like two back-to-back, you know, 66s by any means. Well, look at how the course even changed after the weather delay. Yeah, I mean it was firm and fast. Now you get some rain, and all of a sudden these guys are coming up short. They're not; they can't get the ball back to the flag stick. It was those two different golf courses after that. So this was an interesting week, and I, I'm with both of you. Like, I don't need this to be an even par winning the tournament, but I 25 under. No, 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 no. This this is this is the this is my Super Bowl of golf. <laughs> <laughs> No, I totally agree. And you look at uh, Hideki. So Hideki prevails. You know what? Hideki has had no top 10s in majors since 2017 and none at Augusta since 2016. And this just kind of essentially came out of nowhere. I don't know anyone that really had him in any of their, you know, their monopoly pools. Uh, you know, I just, I, I haven't heard much about him recently. And it was very interesting to see him as in command as he was for the last, you know, for the last 27 holes or so. It was very impressive. And all the pressure from his country, you know, they talked about that a lot. There are so many golfers in Japan and so many people that were really kind of, you know, he's been obviously the best player from their country for quite some time. You know, they've got 9.3 million golfers in Japan out of 125 million people. It's a very sport obsessed nation. And I just couldn't imagine going to sleep last night with all the pressure for that. 
you know, with a four stroke lead and then still getting it done today. So kudos to Hideki. Uh, and the other thing I really liked about Hideki is he actually makes me feel good about my pre-shot routine from a speed standpoint. So I kind of enjoyed, <laughs> you know, he makes me look like a quick player. So that was good too. You see also like, I mean, I don't know if he does this. They showed, they showed a lot of front facing with his putting and, and, and front facing shots when he was, when he was also on the tee box. And I, I always feel like as a guy who struggles to break 90, right. I'm, I'm constantly trying to figure out like, all right, when do I shift my weight? How do I shift my weight? I mean, he's literally like putting 70% of his weight on his left leg before he even starts his swing. It's almost like he's cheating. Like I would cheat as a guy who shoots 95, like, ah, screw it. I'm just going to start with my weight this far left. And he just won the masters doing it that way. So Hideki for all of us who are trying to cheat our way to a better swing, <laughs> you carried the torch for us. Thank you. I, I can't say I love that part about his golf swing. However, if I'm just going to diagnose this, if I'm looking at him at like impact, boy, that's pretty freaking good. I, I mean, obviously, he just won the Masters. He's, he's going to kick the crap out of me every time I go play golf. Um, and it just proves there's there's not just one way to do this. There's multiple ways to do this. And speaking of ways to do it, David, do you prefer to play rounds of golf with a putter or without a putter? Are you more of a... <laughs> I mean, did, so Phil, did you see what Siwoo Kim did on Friday? This guy is in contention. He's on the green in two on 15. He gets a little hot with it, runs it by the hole, and all of a sudden just lays it into the ground. Now it's bent, and now he's using a three-wood. And he actually did pretty well with the three-wood to finish the last four greens, but that, that was crazy to me. So dumb you, question. You, Are you not allowed to use – so if, if it's determined that, like, the shaft is broken, but it's still sort of intact, can you not use that club? Correct. Okay. Because I was going to say, I'd almost rather use a slightly broken putter than a three wood for the next four holes. But if it's. By the way, he busted two clubs at the 3M Open two years ago. (laughs) Someone runs a little hot. He might need to calm down a little bit. (laughs) You you know what? Here's what I'm going to give him. No, that would not be my club of choice. I am going to intentionally blade wedge. I'm taking out my highest lofted wedge. I'm just going to hit that right in the forehead of the golf ball. I think we've all done it being a just character of being lazy on a short putt and it actually has a practical play if you're caught up against the rough on the on the fringe but he put a really good roll on it with a fairway wood it was pretty amazing it, yeah that's it's incredible so if you do have a broken club or you're in need of a new golf club a great place to go buy those new clubs would be at the new PXG store in Southdale And those guys are just rocking right now. They've been extremely busy, but you can call them today and get a full fitting experience. They've got the new Gen 4 clubs are in. Um, Nobody makes the clubs the way they do. It's all direct to consumer. They work with you directly. Uh, It's a very special fitting experience. So check out pxg.com or call their store today at PXG Southdale. Phil, have you tried the PXG clubs yet? Are you still working through a few different swings and you really don't want to tr- try any golf clubs until you've tried out a few more things? I, uh, I'm still still tinkering. I have not I have not swung a PXG club yet, but we do talk about PXG on Mackie and Judd and Purple Daily every single day. Um, and and I'm and I'm told that I'm gonna I, I I saw a couple swag items, a hat and a couple shirts that I'm interested in. So we're gonna start with the swag, and then we might. <laughs> Once my game is worthy, we might uh, we might put the PXGs in my hands. We'll see. <laughs> I like it. Um, another interesting thing that happened this week, I noticed no amateurs made the cut, which was kind of a sad deal. Uh, you know, it's something I always look forward to is they you know they do some really cool things for the amateurs for the low am. And there's been some pretty big names that have been the low amateur before. Brandy, what would you think about that? Because I I haven't seen that. I think it was 2015 or something since the last time where no amateurs made the cut. Uh, I don't actually know the stat of when that was, but I mean, this tournament's got a history of the amateur. In fact, this tournament's got a history of a lot of traditions. I mean, Tiger Woods was a low am in, in 95 and then won it in 97. Uh, Bryson was a low am about five yeah, years Bryson, ago. Yeah, Bryson was a low am. Um, I don't, I guess I don't know the stats on that, but it, it's interesting that no am made the cut because that's a huge part of this, this event. Um, I was actually researching a little bit today. Because I think, to me, the tradition of the Masters is so cool. I mean, everything from the Champions Dinner, which that was really cool this year where they had a place for Tiger laid out and 
Tiger was even kind of trolling DJ on social media about running up his tab and how he wouldn't be there to do it. So that was kind of cool. But here's a couple of uh, random traditions that people don't always know about. Brad, you alluded to one already. There's no cell phones allowed at the event. You can check them at the gate. They have incredibly low food prices. You get a beer for five bucks. You get a sandwich for three bucks. Because of the fence around the course, there hasn't been a deer sighting on property in 65 years. Wow. They've also not seen any sightings of squirrels, birds, or insects. I don't know how you can not have insects, but whatever. And they've been rumored to pipe in the bird sounds on the on the broadcast for years. The ponds and lakes are all dyed. In 1996, Golf Dice actually tested one and found food dye in it just to make them look that good. Wow. I mean, this place is immaculate. If you haven't been there, it's immaculate. This was one I didn't know about, though, until today when just doing some reading. The fishing out there is amazing, but they're not allowed to talk about it. Like, the players are talking about whole, the whole 12 is really, really good. But no one's allowed to talk about it. But one caddy actually kind of spilled the beans a little bit and said, yeah, you go fish in hole 12, you can catch some stuff. And then I don't know if you guys have, have seen any of this, but Augusta National is trying to really clean up Augusta as a city and they're buying up every business around there and every home around there. But they've got one home on property that is refusing to sell. And they have declined millions and millions. And apparently it's located somewhere in in their parking lot. I mean, the, the history behind this event and this course, uh, it, it goes on forever. My, my list can go on for another seven minutes here if I really wanted to, to go do this. Going back to even 2012 and Clayton Baker made headlines for stealing sand from a bunker and got arrested. What What is your, if, if we could do an impromptu Mount Rushmore of like the most masters things ever, what would what, what what would your George Washington be? Is it is it Jim Nance whispering in hushed tones? Is that the most masters thing ever? Is, you know, it, actually, is it the fact that everyone every play by play person, it's almost like a mandate that you have to pause for like a beat and a half before you say, the masters. I I actually said this to my wife today at dinner. I said I don't know what I'm gonna do when Jim Nance retires. Is, is this mean, event what, the what, same? What are what are any of us gonna do? It, uh, He's he's as much of this event as anything. So yeah. who who is being groomed to be the next Jim Nance? That's a great question. Like Dude, who, well, well Ver, Vern Lundquist, by the way, I don't know if he was okay at the end of the broadcast today. Did you guys hear? <laughs> like he was yeah. sputtering on fumes at the end. There was there was a moment. So he's I'm assuming he was at 16 Tower like he always is, and uh, they go to 16 and he and he like it, it was like he could barely talk. He was like. Uh, why don't you guys talk until he makes the shot? And then I, I just think he was on fumes. And uh, if that was the end for Vern Lundquist, was this supposed to be his last broadcast? I know he's scaled back. He doesn't do SEC football anymore. I don't know. I, I do know, though, that once I hear his voice, I know it's 16 at Augusta or or maybe number six at Augusta, you know, but that's like that's the cue. You know that that situation. And I'll always whenever I hear his voice, immediately think of Tiger in 2005. Yeah. You know, like that just all of a sudden it just kind of that's my my memory thing there. But I, I'd love to know who are his, who will be Vern Lundquist's replacement. Who will be Jim Nance's replacement? Well, here, here's the thing. You're not going to have to worry about this for like 20 years, you know, barring some sort of hell situation. So Vern Lundquist is 80, and he's just now finally being phased out of Masters telecast, right? <laughs> Jim Nance is only 61 years. He turned 62 years old in May. So I, I think Jim Nance probably has a good 15-plus years left as the lead Masters play-by-play -play guy. So I, I don't know who. I don't know if... I don't know if there's like a young, you know, if there's somebody on a different network or something that could pop up, but Jim Nance ain't letting that thing go for maybe Tony Romo. Maybe Tony Romo's the guy in like 15 years. He's 20 years younger than Jim Nance. I was how thinking how maybe like a Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> that could work Seth too. MacFarlane. It could be kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Probably offend a lot of people, but uh, we'd be giggling. I'm here for it. Oh. <laughs> 
I, there, yeah, there's other tournaments I'd put him at before the Masters. <laughs> Phoenix the way, Open. I was going to say, the Waste Management Open would be a perfect spot. <laughs> so the, the Zurich for some walk-up music. Or... <laughs> yes. What's a, what was your guys' favorite shot of the week? Because for me, on hole 15, Jordan Spieth and Shane Lowry are both behind the green. They both chip it. It's coming in a little hot. Jordan Spieth's ball hits the pin and goes in because that's the kind of luck that Jordan Spieth has, and Shane Lowry's ball ends up in the middle of the lake. And Lowry's ball was hit softer than Spieth's, but Spieth's was just absolutely perfect when it hit the pin and went straight down. So that, to me, was like – that that took the cake for me. But what was your guys' favorite shot of the week that, that you remember the most? That's a good question. I, I'm probably going to go with Spieth because it, did he did he hole out twice this week? Mm-hmm. I mean, he does a couple times every week he plays. So it's, it's not it really. Seems like, it seems like every, I mean, we've talked about this in the show before. It seems like, and this is the issue I have with some of his, or a big part of his career, it's almost like he's making a career on luck in a weird way because he's hitting 40-foot bombs, 50-foot bombs. Oh, I'm just going to hole it from 30, 40 yards. So I'd say, I mean, shots of the week, it's, it's going to Spieth. Yeah, Spieth, I think um, my favorite shot was probably the the big, like, he made a putt where he was aiming, like, 90 degrees to the right today. Um, so he's always just, like, draining these long, ridiculous putts or holding out from, you know, 30 yards down off the green. So that, that putt that he made, and it kind of made it feel like, oh, maybe he is going to make a run and get back in this thing. But, yeah, Spieth had a lot of moments this week for sure. Phil, we can't do a show without talking about two players, and we didn't really say much before, so I have to acknowledge that Rory McIlroy was in the field this week. Uh, Rory, Rory McIlroy did hit his dad with a ball on Thursday. Uh, Rory McIlroy did shank one on Friday, and Rory McIlroy did miss the Dude, cut. So that sh- Actually, that shank was my favorite shot of the week, and I love Rory, but oh my God. I mean, that, they, they, had, they had the CBS tracker on that too. It just straight right. Oh my God! It was that was a straight hosel shank. <laughs> Speaking of Rory, though, how about the uh, the visit he had with Tiger in the past? Uh, was it two weeks? And he goes to Tiger's house, and they meet in the living room. Tiger's got all fifteen of his major trophies in the living room. What? And and, and Rory and, goes and a cat and and like a body cast up to his neck. Yeah, exactly. And, and Rory goes, "Where are your other trophies?" And Tiger goes, "I don't know." Wait, this was this like in the last two weeks? This is like in the last two weeks. A lot of players have been visiting Tiger. Uh, JT's been there a couple of times. Rory's been there. And yeah, Rory's in his living room amongst 15 major trophies and asks, where are your others? And he says, I don't know. Mm. I want to know, does Tiger just keep those tro- – is, is he just goofing on the guys that come? Or, or do you think he just has those very narcissistically placed around his living room at this point? I've heard rumors he's got an extensive trophy room and he does this to just kind of edge these younger players. Uh, but I don't know. But, I mean, I've always <laughs> loved the sarcasm of his responses to some of this yeah, stuff. Right. Like, if you get if you get random questions, since we're talking about these young players, we've talked about Shoffley. If you had to put, like, your entire savings, all right, if, if there's some crazy scenario where, like, your entire financial future and your family's is is you having to guess which golfer is going to win the most majors over the next let's say seven to eight years who are you picking there's so many dudes right now i feel oh, like man is it bryson no just, just bombing at the the open i think bryson will win more tournaments if i had to pick who would win more pj tour events i might say bryson yeah, they'll just yeah. Ma- majors. No, um, boy, Brad, can I punt you on that one? For a it's minute? a tough one because there's a lot of reasons why some of these guys don't win. <laughs> um, John Rom is my. Yeah. I, I think John Rom. I think he, you know, and he continues to be a top ten guy a lot. But I think he he also has that ability to kind of just. You know, when he's a little more focused, this week he wasn't quite there, and he still took what fourth, fifth. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's. I think John Rahm's a guy for me. How about you, Phil? I love the John. I, I I would probably go JT, but I also feel like he just he's also kind of a hothead, and it, it kind of feels like he 
he goes in and he has all the right things that he says all the right things and he knows how he wants to be mentally but then he always has a spaz day or a hole or something that completely derails everything um like i can't remember what hole it was but didn't he have like a triple bogey on saturday that just completely took him out of all contention i feel like that happens to him almost all the time in majors john rom seems like a cyborg he's just this emotionless robot cyborg who's creative and I'm with you. I think there's going to be a run of majors for him at some point. So, and he also he's cooled off quite a bit in the last couple of years. But he was very hot under the collar a couple yeah. of years ago. He's definitely scaled it back, and that's why I think he's you know he's in a better spot. I honestly like I, I maybe I'm just too all in. I Shoffley would be in the mix for me. I think that dude is there's something about him, and he's just always in the mix. Um. Shoffley, like if, if this is a draft and, and, and John Rahm's already off the board and Brad has taken him, I might actually go Shoffley. He's always in the mix. You, you know what? I'm going to take Spieth on this. He's proven he can win a major. I don't think he's done. He's getting his game back. I'm also biased. I just really like Spieth. But... That's uh, fair enough. That's fair enough. So you guys brought up something interesting about all these guys going and visiting Tiger's house. You know, and kind of Tiger telling them stories. And I was sitting here just giggling. My wife and I really enjoy the Oceans trilogy. And it's kind of reminds me of like Oceans 13 where Ruben's in the, the bed and the guys all just go every day and they like talk to him and, you know, they say things to him. And eventually then just Ruben just shows up ready to go when he wants to take down, uh, you know, at the end of the movie when he wants to take down, oh, who is it? Uh, not Andy Garcia, but... Uh, I'm spacing on it. Uh, in Ocean's 13, whoever they're going after, I, I'm totally spacing right now. Pacino. And uh, it just, that's kind of what I, I feel like all of a sudden Tiger's just going to show up one day and just be like, I'm back, boys. You know, and he's just going to do it all over again, just just like Ruben did in uh, Ocean's. I think he plays again. I think he plays again in like two years. I don't think I think he. I think he wins again. Wow. Wow. I think he wins again. I think he wins, this guy did, I think he wins the Masters again? You got one more Masters in? A little four, 48 years old? Yes. Yes. Wow. I will go out and say yes. This wow. guy does not have it in him to not do it. Um, yeah, I guess I'll go on record right now. He's going to win another Masters. There it is. Was it April 11th, 2021? 9.42 p.m. as we record <laughs> this. Central Standard Time. David yep. Branstad has put his stamp. Reckless speculation with David Branstad. That's, you know, I'm wearing my Timberwolves sweatshirt over here thinking that we're going to get into some reckless speculation, but Branny has just thrown out that. Speculation. (laughs) Hey, the Wolves just won by four. Wow. That's uh, anything's possible. You know, there's a lot of positive things happening. Anything is possible. Wolves beat the Bulls. I love it. Uh, (laughs) So before we wrap up here, I wanted to get into some local stuff. We've had decent weather. It's not been great here, but courses are open all over the place, Phil. People are pumped about spring. It's it's dicey at best because you know how Minnesota springs are. Um, this is like a winter in Seattle right now. Yeah. 45 to 55, some rain, some wind. You could play. You could not play. But Minnesota people are wearing shorts because that's how we do. Yep. Uh, so we've got some good things happening with our college golf teams. You know, we talked a few weeks ago about how hard it is to come out of the winter and all of a sudden go play against Arizona State, who is just, you know, totally locked in. Well, our Gopher men's team this week uh, just finished third place at the Boilermaker Invite. Uh, they shot 281, 292, 286, so they're five under. Pretty awesome uh, for this early in the season for a team from the north. And actually, Angus Flanagan, who we talk about quite a bit on this show from the U, won the tournament. So he shot nine under for three days. So pretty cool to see the men uh, trending. And then on the women's side, uh, the ladies played at the Indiana Spring event and took third out of fit, out of five teams. So the both teams are kind of ramping up towards the Big Ten Championships April 23rd to 25th in Ohio. Uh, fun to see them trending. And we just had the Minnesota State High School League wrap up winter championships this weekend. So, Phil, I don't know if you caught any of the uh, the state basketball tournaments or hockey tournaments, but those were pretty uh, big here this week. I know 
with you living in Washington, there's a lot of rumors that the number one basketball player in the country who happens to be at Minnehaha Academy might be uh, going to Gonzaga, which isn't that far from you. I love, um, so So Chet Thomas, I believe is his name? Holmgren. Chet Holmgren. All right. So uh, I love that Ben Johnson, new gopher basketball coach, shot his shot a couple weeks ago and picked up the phone and called Chet, even though Chet is like 95% going to Gonzaga. If you're Ben Johnson, take that swing, man. I love it. I'm also uh, really looking forward to when Alex Rodriguez moves the Timberwolves out here to Seattle to try and get back in the good graces of that'll be yeah that'll be great. My God, that's a whole other yeah, podcast is, for tomorrow. Is, yeah, I said injured. that's a that's an hour long conversation, but that's oh my God, we're an interesting. So Phil, hours. what? <laughs> Uh, since the pandemic, one of the th has hit. Uh, one of the things that David and I have wanted to do every week is talk about a local business that we've supported um, because obviously we've lost so many, you know North North Loop, um, so many places that you used to go to all the time. They a lot of the businesses uh, are no longer there. So mm -hmm. trying to talk about a local business we support every week and the original idea is that it's supposed to be a new place every week, but I've fallen into this really bad rut where I go to the same places every week. They're locally owned, but uh, I don't get that far outside my bubble. So instead of trying to lie or say something else, I'm just gonna share different menu items that I had at those places. <laughs> uh, so I played golf at Rum River Hills for the, probably the five millionth time in my life. And I uh, went to Margie's, my sister's restaurant in Andover, uh, did the Friday night fish fry and then had the Sunday brunch and the Sunday brunch free, uh, features a stuffed hash brown, oh. which if you like hash browns and you like everything else that breakfast involves, go to Margie's, try the stuffed hash brown. It's supposed to be shared by two people. I find it to be more of a single serving, but you know, that's to each their own. Uh, some good stuff there. So Brandy, who'd you support this week? So I actually want like, is it like two blocks north of Margie's? Uh, to Pappy's. Nice. Pappy's Cafe. We took the kids out there uh, the other day for breakfast, and it's it was fantastic. And they were busy, which was fun to see. One of the things I like about Pappy's, which I didn't know, my youngest son, who's six, uh, they anything on their menu, they will make into a kid's size, which was kind of cool. So Pappy's Cafe in Andover. Loved it. You said so, two blocks. That's actually a lie. They actually is kind of connected by parking lots. <laughs> so yeah, it's, right, yeah, maybe it's hundred feet. <laughs> Pappy's in Andover. Awesome spot. Phil, have you found any cool places in Seattle that you've been able to support? A million of them, but I want to give you a Minneapolis one because we've, so we've been out here for a month and the, the last place strategically that we ordered takeout from was Red Rabbit, downtown Minneapolis. Ooh. One of my favorite restaurants in the Twin Cities, that mushroom flatbread the oh my god like any pasta thing on that menu is ridiculous but specifically the mushroom flatbread is absurd and one of the best manhattans you're ever going to drink if you partake so <laughs> red rabbit minneapolis was the last takeout before we headed west good times and have you made it to pike's place yet a couple times yeah we've done we've done a few cliche things down here we've done the market we did the space needle which is amazing um and uh, we're gonna hopefully hopefully dust off the clubs and get some get some swings in at a non uh, major championship course just to put the training wheels on. Looking forward. Pike, to it. Pike's Place Market has this local. Well, that's all local. Pike, Pike's Place. This place you can just go buy a cup of crab meat with shrimp sauce. That is out of oh. this world. Have to it's been probably sure. five years since I've been there and done it, but oh my god. Yeah, it's inject that into my veins. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That whole Seattle experience of getting the, you know, going to the original Starbucks, getting your cup of coffee, walking around, getting all sorts of fresh seafood and fruit and veggies. And then we walk behind there and you can kind of see, you know, basically you feel like you're walking around on the, um, uh, in free Willy, you know, where you kind of see some of the, the stuff and you're, you know, you're just waiting for Willy to come jumping out of the, the water. It's, it's a pretty cool experience right there in the sound. And, uh, we, we're glad that you're enjoying it out there. So we really appreciate you joining us tonight. Super uh, fun. It's great to have you on again. Uh, we'd also like to thank our sponsors, Jarrett Yalen, uh, Northwestern Mutual. Jarrett's doing some great work there. So again, if you happen to win $2.1, $2.2 million, even if you take second at the Masters and win $1.2, Will Zalatoris, give Jarrett a call. He'll help you out. 
Give him a call if you take third in your men's <laughs> league too. He'll help you out. <laughs> Pro shop credit, he can help with as well. He, he knows his way around a golf shop. Uh, our friends at PXG doing some awesome things there for club fitting. They are very busy, so call them right away and get booked so you can get in and get fitted for some new Gen 4 clubs. Um, as always, you can connect with us at 10kswings at scorenorth.com via email. And please subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcast: Apple, Spotify, Score North, and give us a five-star rating. For episode eight, we will be back with Jeff Kaiser from the University of Minnesota, who has actually played Harbor Town. So someone that knows the course will be able to break it down next week, and he's all in on the college golf scene. So he can share some cool things and actually tell you about some of the guys you watched on TV this week that first made a breakout at the Gopher Invitational. So that should be quite the treat. Until next week, friends, I'm Brad Cole. I'm David Branstead. Oh, and I'm Phil Mackey. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.